You know, when you walk into a big church and you're dealing with the issue of who you're going to talk to, you know the sort of thing? Um, maybe more after church than before, when you think about it. Um, and there's such a lot of potential people there to talk to, unlike here, uh, maybe. Uh, so there's actually going to be a real choice to be made. Who do you want to give time to? Who do you want to spend time and be seen spending time with? This becomes an issue. Who's a cool, cool person to spend your time on? And uh, who should you really be shooing away a bit? very practical sort of problem that uh, some of the stuff that Jesus teaches us in this passage that it actually bears on. There are other situations it bears on and there are things that will help us from it. But that's the sort of very practical problem that Jesus is dealing with in Mark 10, 13 to 16. Who should you welcome and who should you shoo away? Okay, well the context of this short passage is one of Jesus teaching what it means to follow a rejected, suffering, crucified Messiah, who is at one and the same time the Son of Man, the glorious Son of Man figure from Daniel 7. What does it mean to follow him? What, what, what is it teaching us about? Well, this passage of scripture, Mark 10, 13 to 16, is teaching us about not bigging ourselves up and choosing who we'll spend time with according to that bigged up image of ourselves. Because you need to see yourself as a little person to enter the kingdom of God, the assembly of the saved. And in spite of what's happened in Mark 9, the previous chapter, verses 33 to 37, where Jesus is in the house teaching, and he actually goes and he brings the children from the back wall, do you remember that? And he brings them into the, into the circle, the inner circle. In spite of what's happened there, the disciples, whilst they might have acknowledged the truth that was expressed in that passage, they've not taken that truth into their hearts yet. That, heart hasn't, that, that, that truth hasn't changed their hearts, it hasn't moulded and reshaped and refashioned them. And when they're pressurised and rushed with Jesus having a heavy meet and greet involving little ones session, their unreformed attitude of heart spills over. And it's embarrassing. It's embarrassing. Because Jesus corrects them, teaches them, then expresses in actions the way that they should have the things that they ought to have known to do. Uh, they haven't done them because actually he's taught them this already. And there's a lesson to learn in that as well, isn't there? You see people sometimes, and they've come from a very hyper-religious sort of background, and, and they've always lived on the basis of the rules. It's a bit like Santa, you know, if you're a good boy or a good girl, you'll bring you a present, and if not, you don't. It's that sort of attitude, and it gets into your thinking, and it gets into your responses and the way you behave. And they become a Christian, and yeah, they, they, they're now saved by grace, and they know that, and they understand it, but they actually take a very long time to get the patterns of behaviour and attitudes out of their system. And that's the sort of thing that's happening here with the disciples and these little children and Jesus. People were bringing little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them, but the disciples rebuked them. See, actions are speaking louder here in verse 13. Actions are speaking louder. They know this stuff. They know that, but it hasn't got into their attitude, their reaction and their response. Because as the people bring little children to Jesus, for him to place his hands on them, lovely thing, the disciples rebuke them. Said last time when we were looking at, Luke, at Mark 9, 36 to 37, the child's place was the least important in society, in the eyes of the society that Jesus was, was, was living in and teaching in back there. So in Mark 9, 36 to 7, then they came to Capernaum, and when he's in the house, he asked them, what were you arguing about on the road? They kept quiet, because on the way they'd been arguing about who would be the greatest. And sitting down, Jesus called the twelve, and he said, anyone who wants to be first must be the very last and the servant of all. And he takes a little child in his arms, he places the child among them, and taking the child up in his own arms, he, he says, whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but the one who sent me. So in this earlier passage, the whole point is the child is the least important member of society of these people. And Jesus teaches there that we shouldn't be looking for status to be the most important looking member of our society. But take the initiative in welcoming to ourselves and into our company... Those who, like these little children, are seen by society as being of low status take those in. 
Because in welcoming those of low status, we somehow welcome the one who laid aside his status in order to identify with lowly humanity in being rejected, suffering, laying down his life on the cross for our salvation. And we follow that suffering saviour who made himself low. He, though he was rich, yet he became poor so that we through his poverty might become rich. That is the big theme here. That's the big theme. It's following that divine parabola. You know, Jesus came from the glory of heaven. It's an upside down parabola thing, isn't it? See, he comes, very pictorial. Did you see that, the waving of the hand? Marvellous. So, so he who is great and highly exalted comes very, very low, rejected, suffering, despised, son of man, and then ascends to glory. He was rich, became poor, so that we through his poverty might become rich. Now is the time for poverty of spirit. So, Jesus deliberately takes on the status of the statusless outsider, the little people. And in this example that we're looking at here, he brings the little people into his circle to include the little people. And he teaches his disciples, who were to follow him as the rejected and suffering Messiah, that they should follow him in doing this themselves. He's done that in chapter 9. And now one chapter later, they've heard it, they know it, but the principle just hasn't sunk in. And our translation makes explicit what's implicit in this text. The parents were bringing the little children to Jesus. And with the parents there, the children would surely not have been rebuked by the disciples. We should probably conclude it is the parents that the disciples are rebuking from bringing these statusless little ones to pester the great man, the Lord Jesus. There is no suggestion there's going to be any formal or liturgical going-ons here. This is not about infant baptism. Quite a few of the commentaries go on about that. Uh, there ain't no water apart from anything else. It's a bit of a, bit of a dodgy one. Um, but there it goes. What it's about is taking the low person and accepting them and putting them in the centre and, and trying to be a blessing to them. The, the developed tradition in Judaism recorded in the Mishnah of esteemed and aged rabbis laying hands on and blessing children. But that is later. All that stuff is later. It comes later than this. This is just perfectly straightforward. We don't even need to assume this is a particular act of devotion or piety. It, it need be no more than the first century Palestinian equivalent of autograph hunting. They're bringing children to Jesus. He's the big man. And then, you know. And the disciples think that this is something they ought to protect Jesus from. They've forgotten chapter 9. And Jesus rebukes them for their rebuke. Actions are speaking louder than words in verse 13. So they've done that. They've told these people off for bringing these children. And Jesus turns to his disciples and he rebukes his disciples openly. Verse 14a. When Jesus saw this, that is that they rebuked people for bringing babies to Jesus. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant. There's an interesting word there. It's a long word. Heganatesen. And it, it is a word Mark only uses once. He uses it here. It really means something very close to the Greek word orge for angry. But Mark keeps this one for the sort of situation that's just, just been described. Scripture keeps this one for the sort of situation that's been described. Jesus is indignant about something and issues a warning. Um, we've prayed and there have been all sorts of things coming up that we've prayed about. Okay, And uh, we've had the chance this morning to comment on what a hard, broken, nasty world it can be. I'm quite glad, seeing the things I see on a pretty regular basis, I'm quite glad Jesus gets indignant about certain things. I'd find it difficult if he didn't. Here he is getting indignant about something that's important to him and important in this world. See, Jesus has got generous intentions. We forget that. He's, he's generous in intent. He is in the world to fulfill the eternal plan and purpose of God in Christ, to reunite the broken cosmos. To re reunite the broken cosmos by bringing each individual to himself. And he is indignant that the disciples are functionally blocking that purpose. Does that make sense? 
It's a broken old world. They're little people. They're the outsiders. They feel the brokenness of it. And the eternal plan and purpose of God is to bring all things together again in a broken world under the headship of Christ. And they're stopping them bringing these people to Jesus. So Jesus tells his disciples to let these actual children come to him. Don't do that wrong thing. Do this right thing. Let those little children come to me. Now, of course, in this situation, they're literal children. But the point that's being made, and the point that was made back in chapter 9 with reference to deep water and millstones, is that the little ones have a metaphorical reference to. They're the people who are laying aside status and standing and stopping being up themselves in order to come to Christ and to receive his salvation as imperfect sinners lost, but for his grace. These people who may seem unacceptable to you, let them come to me. Don't forbid them, because the kingdom of God is made up of ones like this. Let the children come to me. Do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Millstones, deep water. You know the thing he was saying back in chapter 9, verse 42. Be very, very wary about hindering the little people. Why? because the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Here's the point. A person, any person, must needs renounce standing and status and position and prestige to come as a sinner to Jesus if they are ever to enter the kingdom of God. We're going to see more of that later in Mark's Gospel. And you don't renounce those things, standing, status, position, prestige. You don't renounce those things to become a Christian, to come into God's kingdom and then pick them back up again. That would be inconsistent, hypocritical and disqualifying to some extent. You would no longer be a follower of Jesus. Where you start with Jesus is where you go on, you see. It's to such as these that God's kingdom belongs in a functional, ongoing sort of way. Now Jesus is going to really hammer the point home. Ready? He corrects their action. Yep, we've seen that. And uh, he teaches truth. Truly I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. Here's the point. If you're not prepared to become the statusless one, which the little child represents, if you're not prepared to become that, you will not receive the kingdom of God, you will not enter it. There are 14 of these truly I tell you sayings in Mark's Gospel. It may be a good series, but I've never heard one preached uh, on the 14 truly I tell you sayings in Mark's Gospel. Um, they're generally taking the map out especially important announcements, okay? So several convey promises or warnings about spiritual rewards and penalties. They're quite linked to that. So here too, there is a warning about failing to enter the kingdom of God through insisting on your standing, your prestige, your status, and preventing yourself from entering God's kingdom like a little child. Jesus could not stress more clearly the importance of stopping trying to be a big man in the church. If somebody says to you, he's a big man in the church, and there's some evidence for that, there's some credibility for that, th th he may not be. He may not be. Because you can't be a big man in the kingdom of God. Dick France has got... D Dick France is... He taught me in Bible college years ago with hair on my head and beard and everything. And um, he... Um, He's got this really interesting little sentence in his commentary on this point. He says, their grown-up, and he puts it in commas, you know, their grown-up sense of values presents, prevents them from being in tune with God's value scale. Their grown-up sense of values, I'm somebody, right, prevents them from being in tune with God's value scale. God's got a different scale of value. So he stopped them as Jesus, he's rebuked them, he's corrected them, he now finally sets them the example that they, as his disciples, should follow. And he took the children in his arms, placed his hands on them and blessed them. Nasty, smelly little things. Sticky, smelly children. Great, so the point is, 
Jesus loves the crash. Yeah? I love the crash. It's great. Lovely. Like all that stuff. No. Well, possibly, but not exactly. Since the last chapter, at least, with its stuff about millstones, Jesus has meant by little children or little ones a lot more than simply people of early age. And he's using the literal little ones here to refer to those with the attitude of unassuming lowliness that following him entails. And it ain't easy. It ain't easy, that. So let's, in conclusion, ask the question, how? How do we get there and stay there? Because we understand it, like the disciples understood it. But having that work through you, so it conditions your character and your responses and your reactions, especially under pressure as they were at this time. How do you do that? Firstly, you know, you meditate on things you already know about following this sort of Messiah. You meditate on them so they sink in and, and become our character and so determine our responses. We meditate, we think over during the course of our life, during the course of our day, these things. Think on him who was rich but became poor so that we through his poverty might become rich. Just meditate, chew it over. And as you do so, secondly, redefine your thinking on status. What is status? What makes me an important person, a significant person? Because biblically and in kingdom terms, what makes me a significant person is likeness to the rejected, suffering, crucified Son of Man. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. Yeah? We sang that, didn't we, just now? Okay? Be thou my dignity. Thou my delight. Be thou my dignity. We're working for our dignity all the time. We work to be, to, to, we do, don't we? To be somebody in the room. Be thou my dignity. Let's get hold of that. How do we do this? We include the statusless people. We need to do that. That ain't easy. We do it because we had no status with God, but Christ came to change that. And what the Lord Jesus Christ did by virtue of his death and resurrection is that he has changed our status in heaven. So we are declared right with God. We are declared justified. So he's changed our status, having accepted us with none. Does that make sense? Here's why we do this. Here's what motivates us. Christ came to change our status so that we're declared accepted to God, sons, daughters, heirs of the kingdom. And how did he do it? He did it by humbling himself, by he was rich, becoming poor, so that we, through his poverty, might become rich. And the challenge of this nice little passage about these nice little children and Jesus is that we should follow him in that. We should follow him in that. Now, you know what it's like? Um, <clears throat> Well, perhaps you don't, but I'll tell you. Um, what happens is, I stand up on a Sunday and I preach a sermon like that, yeah? And guess what happens Monday? <laughs> you, know, you know where this is going? Maybe Sunday afternoon. A challenge to that comes along. And here we are, we've heard it. Well, where's the challenge going to come from and how are we going to meet it? Let's be on the lookout for that. And ask God to show us what he wants from us and how he wants us to do this. Amen.